Hello, friends. Thanks for joining us as we continue our series on leadership during Lent. We're doing a series on living above reproach. That means living a blameless life as a leader. And uh, today's scripture verse comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. Now listen, this is God's word. I charge you in the presence of God and of, Jesus, and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful to have your word. The timeless truth that it contains speaks into our lives, even though it was written thousands of years ago. Lord, I pray that you would now prepare us to hear and receive your word, and Lord, prepare us to go out and live it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, uh, as I was going through this, I was reminded of the 1800s. There was a time in the Wild West when there were certain schemers and charlatans who roamed the American countryside. And these uh, individuals were not good guys. They often went around swindling good, hardworking citizens from what little money they had earned. They had a con. It went something like this. Uh, the snake oil, snake oil salesman would come up, and in a charismatic way, he would breeze into a town. He would use a, a loud, booming voice and use this uh, flowery language and rhetoric, and he would call people to him, and he would offer them a small little vial uh, filled with snake oil. And he would describe to these folks uh, that snake oil was something that came from another culture, often a Chinese culture, and had various health remedies that would be associated with it. And they were usually very grand. Uh, you know, the crowd would normally be kind of skeptical at first. Well, who is this guy and what is he teaching us and how do we know it's accurate? But then somebody who would be randomly selected from the crowd would come forward and he would sample the product, and oh my goodness, amazingly, this person would be miraculously healed. All of their symptoms would go away, and they'd be dancing and joyfully. And everybody who saw this whole scene thought, well, I guess that's the evidence I need. And they would spend all of their money buying up this stuff, only to find out it was basically just a rattlesnake oil. And it did hardly anything for them um, at all. And by the time they realized that they had been conned, usually the salesman and his shill would be long gone. And that's how the con went. And you know, since its inception, since the church's inception, we've had various forms of snake oil salesmen come and go through the church throughout the past two millennia. You know, the Apostle Paul repeatedly warned his protege Timothy to watch out for false teachers or heretics who were actively out there trying to introduce new things, twisting doctrines, twisting the core teachings of Orthodox Christianity, um, because they were trying to bring something that was appealing um, and, uh, and, and sensual and new, and just to get attention and to get money from people often. Um, many of these heresies, still kind of variations of them exist today. Uh, you know, one of these versions of this is the old heresy that you can earn your way to heaven through good works. You know, back in the first century, there were many people called Judaizers. Basically, there were Christians, there were Jews who had become Christians, and there were some of these individuals who believed that they needed to enforce new Christians that were Gentiles to follow the Old Testament law of Moses, in addition to accepting Jesus as their Savior. Some people call this the Jesus plus religion. And, you know, there's still a lot of that that's going on in the church today. Some people think... You know, uh, God helps those who help themselves, or my good deeds, you know, are, are my penance to get me into heaven. But friends, the Bible actually shows us that the grace of God is for those who can't help themselves. And the whole Bible, the good news of the Bible is that even when we were running away from God, Jesus came down to us and died for us, um, even when we didn't ask him to. Why? Because we needed it. And that's, uh, that's the beauty of the good news, really, is that we can still receive that today. Uh, that old promise that Jesus said, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. So don't believe that heresy, even if you hear it. There's another heresy that's still in the church uh, these days, uh, which is that the spirit is all good and that the flesh or the body is all bad. 
Um, you know, this, this kind of concept is called dualism. And we see various forms of this through an influence of another religion called Gnosticism. Uh, and that has taken so many different forms. I can't even explain them all to you now. It would just take hours. But one of the central claims to this, this idea of Gnosticism is that the world in which we live, the material world, was created by some other demigod, some lesser god. And there's a lot of mistakes in this world, and that's why this lesser god is the one who takes the fall for that. And in order to know the ultimate divine god, who's somehow you know, far away and, and, and not a part of this material world, you have to have this uh, mystical spiritual revelation. And this sounds kind of like a lot of New Age sort of stuff that you see. And, and in order to find this new God, um, you have to have this divine revelation apart from God's word and apart from Jesus. And uh, you have to also despise your body and despise, uh, you know, the material world, which God created originally good. And, uh, and that's, that's actually wrong. You know, the Bible does talk about this duality between flesh and spirit. But that term flesh is a nuanced term, and we have to understand it in order to, to, to understand that that actually means a carnal desire of the flesh, not the body itself. The body itself is uh, a gift from God. Anyways, you could probably see how this doesn't fit into the Bible. You know, Jesus became, uh, had a body, right? So how could he who is God be bad uh, in, in a bad shell if the body is bad too? So, you know, they can also dismiss the virgin birth. They can dismiss the doctrine of incarnation. Um, Jesus' physical death and resurrection, which is essential for our salvation. All of these sort of things get all jumbly, and it's not good. And uh, so we, we have to be wary of versions of this that are around today, Christian science and various New Age religions. Um, you know, we, we are both spiritual and physical beings, and... Um, and so we should need to embrace the divinity and the humanity of Jesus as well. You know, there's many more heresies I could talk about. There's the prosperity gospel, which uh, says that God wants you to be happy. God wants you to have a lot of wealth. And they cite all these wealthy people in the Bible. There's a lot, you know, Abraham, Job, David. Um, but then you look at the disciples and you look at Jesus himself. And they were simple, uh, poor, and even died uh, for their faith. They didn't go up. They went down. And so a prosperity gospel is really to bring people in uh, because it's a way to raise money. Uh, another heresy, and this will be the last one I talk about, which is that Jesus is just one of many ways to get to heaven. Now, obviously, Jesus himself refuted this. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, and you know, there's a lot of people who want to pick that verse apart, but it still stands as God's word. And, uh, and the entirety of what Jesus did upon the cross uh, makes him unique and special, being the only one who is both man and God. He's the only one who could die for our sins. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of other prominent heresies we could talk about. Um, you know, they're still in the church today. Uh, some people don't want to trust the Bible. They don't believe that it's entirely trustworthy because there's the involvement of people in the writing of it. Um, there's another heresy that's going around, which is that people really aren't sinners. They're all basically born good and innocent, which is flat out not true. It's not what the Bible teaches. Um, some people say there's no such thing as a literal Satan or a literal hell. Um, you know, Jesus believed in both of those and preached against them often. Uh, some people say there's no objective right or wrong. Uh, all forms of morality are subjective constructs. Um, that in of itself is an objective claim, therefore self-defeating. Gosh, I could go on like this all day. The point is, is that the church is in dire need of leaders, of teachers, who are capable of teaching sound, pure doctrine from, from the pulpit and in their lives and in everything that the church is doing. We need pure teaching that's coming from God's word. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we read it earlier, Paul's reminding Timothy, he's saying effective preaching is essential to the health and the vitality of the church today. So how, how can we do that? How can we combat all of these heresies with good preaching? Well, Paul actually outlines it for us in the second verse of 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So there you see it, the what, the when, and the how to preach. So let's dive in. First, the what. 
what do we preach? We preach the word. What is that word? The Greek word caruso actually means to preach, means to herald. Uh, a herald was somebody who brought the news to the people or it was somebody who was a public speaker. And you think about it, heralds in, in that time, they didn't make the news. They didn't create it. They simply went town to town and shared it. And, uh, and so essentially a preacher is not somebody who's bringing anything new to the table. They're actually bringing someone else's news, the news of God, God's word. And this constant emphasis points to the Bible itself. This is what we are to preach. The Bible is God's word. And Paul makes this point many times throughout his letters. We see in 2 Timothy 1.8, Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. 2 Timothy 1.13, Hold fast the pattern of sound words. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, The things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men. 2 Timothy 2.15, Rightly divide the word of truth, meaning being able to discern what is God's word and what is man's. 2 Timothy 2.24, a servant of the Lord must be able to teach in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So the Bible is truly God's word. Cover to cover all 66 books of the Bible. And this is what we should teach. You know, it's interesting. When I first became a preacher, I didn't really understand what preaching was fully. I, Truly, I had to grow into that. Um, I thought that I had to come up with some, I had to dig through this Bible, I had to find something that no one else had ever noticed before. Something new, something exciting, because I thought that most everybody knew the Bible. And I thought that when I taught in a church, that people would be bored if I was teaching things that they had heard before, maybe if they were in Sunday school or whatever. And so I shied away from popular texts. I shied away from things that people had, and I looked for obscure, weird out of the way things. And what I found was I spent a lot of my sermons really just explaining details and things. Uh, and and I was, I was looking for something um, and I was missing the main points because I was looking for obscure and, and interesting side things. And I found that there wasn't a lot of power in my preaching in the beginning because people weren't, they weren't really tracking with the deeper truths of God's word. And, you know, and when I, when I really learned in some of my teaching classes and whatnot in college or in seminary and and from other people I respected, you know, dig deep to the deeper truth, the, the core timeless truth that's in there. And if you preach that, it will touch people's hearts. And so when you're thinking in your mind, oh, I don't know all that's in the Bible. Well, truly preach what's in the Bible and the truth of it will actually reach people, even if they think they know it already. Preach it anyway. The second thing we should do as preachers is we should really preach all of God's word, cover to cover. We should preach the whole book. Now, granted, this is a lot to preach, and that's a good thing, right? You've got the best source material. You could spend a whole lifetime preaching text by verse by verse, precept by precept, um, line by line. You could go through the whole Bible this way for an entire lifetime and more, and still have more content to preach from. But we need to preach it all the way through. Thomas Jefferson, one of our founding fathers, was a deist, and he actually took some offense to certain portions of Scripture. And very famously, he decided, well, he was going to edit or redact huge portions of the Bible and make his own Bible. And it, it's, you can buy it today. It's called the, the Jefferson Bible. And the Jefferson Bible deletes all mention of Jesus' divinity, all of his miracles, as well as all the Old Testament prophecies which talk about Jesus as the Messiah. And he also deletes the virgin birth and the resurrection. And he, he's basically saying, the parts of the Bible that I get, that I understand, are the parts that I want, that I believe in. Well, the problem with that is, uh, is that God's word is spoken in its entirety. And when you only pick the parts that you like, well, one is you, you miss out on growing into understanding the parts that you might not like um, at first. And then... Over time, you miss out on the fullness of the message of it. You miss out on the, the depth of it. Uh, you know, I, I got to be honest, the, the Bible's greatest asset is that it can actually interpret itself. You can actually take one portion of Scripture uh, and then look through the whole Bible for other portions and other themes and other things that speak to that and help understand the context and, and understanding of how that Scripture is to be interpreted by the original writer to the original audience. So if you use the Bible as a whole to interpret the Bible in parts, 
you will truly understand those the Bible in parts. You'll be able to go deeper. Um, so be careful not to just randomly pick out one verse and, and not use the rest of the Bible to interpret it because you'll miss out. Um, another thing I like to say in my Bible study on Saturday is when we come across a certain passage and somebody says, look, Lincoln, I really don't understand what this is saying. My response always is, just keep reading. Keep reading. And that's the same thing I say to you today. If you're studying the Bible and you've hit parts of it and you don't like it and it's uncomfortable and you're not sure where it's going, stick with it. Keep reading it. Read it all the way through and read it constantly. And friends, you will find over time that God will open your heart to be able to understand it in your mind too. But you got to preach God's word if you're going to preach anything. Uh, don't look don't look for Reader's Digest sermons and and um, you know people who only talk about their own lives and their personal anecdotes. Stick to the text and teach what God's saying, and uh, and the power of it will be there. So once you once you're preaching the gospel, the next part is preach it when. Well, Paul says, be ready in season and out of season. Well, there's only two pre there's only two seasons for preaching. There's people who there's when people want to hear it. And there's when people don't want to hear it. <laughs> and I think of that old funny cartoon from Looney Tunes with Elmer Fudd. And he's hunting through the forest and he runs into Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck. And they're both fighting and arguing with each other. Duck thiefing, wabbit thiefing. You know, they're going back and forth uh, over which season it is to hunt. Well, for Christians, the truth of the matter is, Paul tells us, we have to preach in both seasons. Whether people want to hear it or whether they don't. But we do this with gentleness and respect. Um, but man, sometimes you just don't want to share God's word. Sometimes you you feel like you're struggling with your faith. Sometimes you feel like you don't totally understand it. You're in, you're up, or you're down. When you're at your best or your worst. And Paul says, look, bring what you can. Bring the Bible and share it anyway. Uh, there was once a Church of England clergyman. And he was gloriously saved. And when Jesus changed his life, he started preaching the gospel to his church. And the whole church got saved too. And then he started preaching to neighboring churches. And the clergymen of those parishes got offended. And they asked him, they asked the bishop, Hey, bishop, you got to go and make this guy stop. And so the bishop confronted him. He said, look, I hear you're always preaching. You don't seem to be doing anything else. And the man answered, well, bishop, I only preach during two seasons of the year. And the bishop said, well, I'm glad to know that. What seasons are they? And he said, in season and out of season. So he gets it. And we should too. <clears throat> so we understand the what and the when. Now let's talk about the how of preaching. Paul tells Timothy these things. He says, reprove, reprove, rebuke, uh, exhort with patience and teaching. So let's walk through those. Reprove. What does it mean to reprove someone? It means to shine light onto something, to, to convict them, to expose uh, something that's in their heart uh, and to expose essentially the teaching of God's word, to let God's word shine upon their life and their actions and their thoughts and let it actually affect them. Um, Paul did this constantly in the synagogues whenever he traveled on his missionary journeys. He would reprove uh, and share the gospel to Jews, um, but then he would also go in other places and he'd preach to Gentiles too. And as he shone the light into those places, People who were already uh, searching for God, they would they would let God's word uh, shine upon their hearts, and it would it would cause them to realize the things in their life that needed to change. So that's one thing we need to shine God's word in a way that helps people change. Acts nineteen eight. He went into the synagogue. He spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. That's what Paul did. We should too. The second is rebuke. To rebuke, that's a tougher word. That means to reprimand. To strongly admonish someone so they're urged to get back on the right path. You think of sometimes as a parent, you have to discipline your child. And sometimes that discipline involves saying, stop it. Nobody wants to say to somebody, stop. You know, don't do that. Uh, often we we take a posture in today's society that that rebuking somebody is actually something that is wrong, something that is um, harsh or judgmental. Uh, but when you rebuke somebody with God's word, it's not necessarily always your personal take on it. You actually rebuke them saying, God's word says that you shouldn't live this way. 
that you shouldn't say those things, that you shouldn't be involved in this sort of activity or with those sort of people. God's word says that. And when you come to somebody who's a brother, somebody, a sister in faith, and you rebuke them with God's word, well, then it's not a personal thing. You're not necessarily going to try and knock them down. You're going out of love and you're trying to get them back onto track with God. And that's actually a beautiful thing. Um, but you have to be careful. You can't always rebuke an unbeliever with God's word because they have not yielded to God's word. They won't have the same effect in their life. They'll actually laugh at you um, if you do that sometimes. So be careful to rebuke a believer with God's word and it will prove to be fruitful in their life, but not so with unbelievers always. Paul rebuked another of his protégés in Titus, whom we're going to study later in this series. And uh, he said to him, Titus 2.15, Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. So don't, don't apologize when you rebuke somebody uh, who is a believer with God's word. If you do it with love and you do it to draw them back onto the right path, that's the right way to do it. Don't do it to knock them down or to one-up them. Um, you know, Jesus said we shouldn't lord over uh, the authority that's been given us onto others. That's what unbelievers do. We should do it with love. The next one is to exhort. Exhorting is to encourage somebody, but it's to do it in a passionate way, like pleading, like a James Brown song. Please, please, please. Um, and you don't always see this too. When somebody decides to fall away uh, from Jesus, they often do it very subtly. It's a very, very subtly thing. And because it's so subtle and it happens over time, we don't always have a passionate moment to be able to try them, draw them back um, because, because out of concern. Um, but there are moments in life when you see somebody, a brother or a sister, who's, who's wandered off the path. Um, maybe they're in a relationship with somebody and you know that uh, the process of that relationship has drawn them away from their love for God, away from their involvement in the church, away from their prayer life, away from God's word. And now they're seeing, you're seeing a lot of compromise in their life. And to go to them and to literally just say to them, listen, I care about you. And, and you know, Jesus died for you. And, and, and I, I want you to know that when you go away, when you, when you ghost the Lord, it breaks his heart. And you can take the scriptures and you can actually show verse after verse of, of how God pleaded with Israel in the Old Testament and how Jesus wept over Israel in the New Testament, over his people, and how he still, you know, God still weeps over us, longing to gather us under his wing. You know, and I, I really think it's passionate uh, sometimes. We need to, to plead with our brothers and sisters who've fallen away from the Lord to draw them back in. Um, because I truly believe that, that God does miss them and, and long for their, their closeness. Um, and, and we should too, when we see a brother or sister fall away from the church, we should plead with them, please come back, we miss you, you know? So uh, rebuke, exhort, um, and uh, what was the first one? Reprove, rebuke, reprove, exhort. And how should we do this? We should do it with patience. You know, you think about how you teach somebody, uh, like a child, proper hygiene. It takes time, right? A child, at first, they don't care about, you know, getting plaque on their teeth and, and rolling around in the mud. They don't care about taking a shower every day. They don't care. Kids are basically like little, they're like little animals. <laughs> you got to teach them the virtue of good hygiene over time. You know, the, the sensation of having clean and healthy gums, the sensation of, of having a nice hot shower and, 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 and climbing into a bed with cold, with nice cool sheets. And, you know, all of these things are, are really a beautiful thing that a parent can teach their child. But you have to stick with it. It takes, it takes a seasons of, of time for them to get it. Same thing with teaching somebody, uh, preaching the gospel to somebody. Sometimes it takes wave after wave and attempt after attempt and, and a gentle word and a rebuke and an exhortation. And you have to mix and match your approach and it, some people, it takes them seven or 17 or 70 times of hearing the gospel before they really truly are going to get it. Um, but the beautiful thing is that if you do this with patience, that each time there's a seed being planted, it's being watered, and it can grow and grow and grow and bear fruit uh, of salvation for that person. And the last thing he says is we must do this with teaching. Um, and what he means is with, with thoughtful, intelligent instruction. Now, it's, you don't want to just tell somebody only the core basics of the gospel. 
you want to invite them into the depths of God's word and the truth and the nuance of Jesus's relationships uh, with humanity, because there's so much in there. And it's in the it's in the deeper teaching. It's in, you know, when you crack open the Bible and you go word by word be- through it, there's so much in there. It's, it's like the ocean. It's deep. It's wide. And it, and it beckons people uh, to search and explore its depths. And, uh, and so when we're able to intelligently respond to the world, let's say the world is very quick to criticize us, um, when we can intelligently answer people's questions calmly, with patience, re- with exhortation, with rebuke, uh, with reproving them, you know, we can be effective preachers of the gospel. And, and that requires that we have to do the, he- the heavy lifting. We have to do the work. We have to actually study this thing inside and out. Um, and we have to get into a Bible study. We have to come to church every Sunday and listen to it preached. We have to crack it open daily on our own. And we have to pray through it and let the Spirit interpret it with us too. And it's a lot of work. But friends, there is fruit in that. There is peace. There is joy. There is understanding. And it's just like, it's like, it's like finding a diamond. You know, it's buried under there. Tons and tons of dirt and rocks and gravel and undesirable things sometimes you have to sift through and sift through and sift through things you might not understand right away things that might not be valuable right away and then all of a sudden you find the truth the treasure of the gospel and you discover it and friends it is just the greatest wonder most wonderful treasure ever and and i just can't encourage you enough to go through the work of carving out time in your schedule of saying no and protecting that time with the Lord, of saying yes and joining that small group, you, this will bear a wonderful fruit. And you'll be able to then share that with others when you do preach. And notice the balance of these things, you know. It, rebuking and reproving, that's a little harsh. But if you balance it with exhortation and, and intelligent teaching and patience, all of these things uh, coming together are how we should preach the Bible. And the final warning for us is we're going out into the world And they're not always going to want to hear us preach. Paul says, For a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. That word endure is is something that we should really think about. They they don't want to hear it, uh, and they won't even tolerate it when they do. Uh, You think about what's happening in today's society. There's a rise of cancel culture. Um, There's there's a, a feigning of respect and tolerance. People say, well, I respect people of different beliefs. But then as soon as they hear something that they don't agree with, it triggers in them a deep, passionate hatred and anger. And and they will not have a civil dialogue. In fact, they actually feel that it's their right and their moral obligation to attack people who teach the truths of God's word. And friends, you have to be careful when you're doing this. Not going around punching people in the face with the Bible or trying to incite people uh, into arguments. No, no, don't, don't go looking for a fight with this. But be aware that we're in a season of time where we need to be able to preach the gospel despite these things and to find the way to do it in love and respect. And um, verse 3, people will actually run from it. They'll have, they, will, uh, they will not endure sound teaching. They'll have itching ears and they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. We see this constantly now. Um, this idea of having itching ears, meaning they're, they're burning to hear uh, an echo chamber, to hear what they want to hear, to hear a version um, of God that's one that they create, not the one that God really is. And instead of pursuing God for who he is, they pursue the version of Jesus or the, or the version of God that they want him to be. And when they don't find it in the church, well, they run to find a, a version of a church and a version of a preacher who gives them what they want, not what they need, which is actually the truth. It says they'll turn away from listening to the truth. They'll wander off into myths. And as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Timothy received his charge, and friends, my fellow believers, so have we. As Paul said, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach sound doctrine. And that's what we should do too. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. I pray now, Lord, that you would give us the desire and the power and the understanding and the patience and the words to go out into our lives and to share your truth with others. 
And I pray that your truth, Lord, would be our greatest desire, our hunger, Lord, because it, it draws us closer to you. And I pray that we would preach from our well, which is constantly be filled by our time with you and our church, which preaches uh, faithfully, Lord, your word too. Help us, Lord, to, to cast the seed of the gospel and may many sinners come to know you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.